Amen. Be seated. All right. We, uh, we have a special, right? Who's singing? Brother Aaron's going to tell us who's singing. In Christ alone will I glory, though I could pride myself in battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure, and by His strength alone I overcome. Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hand. But those trophies could not equal to the grace by which I stand. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory, for only by His grace I am redeemed. And only His tender mercy could reach beyond my weakness to my need. Now I seek no greater honor than just to know Him more. And to count my gains but losses to the glory of the Lord. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. My source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Amen. That's good. Is that your source of hope and victory and, and salvation in Christ alone? All kinds of people trying to figure out different ways. I was uh, reading on the internet today where some people uh, get involved with a website called beliefnet.com and, uh, and I had people asking me questions. It was this, one, this particular article they published was about angels and they said, do you do you think this is okay to read? Do you think this is accurate and biblical? And so I looked at the article. There wasn't a single mention in the whole article to any single verse of Scripture. It was all stuff made up about angels. Not one verse of Scripture. I said, if you want scriptural help, you need to look somewhere else. <laughs> that won't get it. <laughs> and uh, if somebody wants to make stuff up, I can make my own stuff up. You know, I want to make something up. But I need God's Word. <laughs> I really need some help. And if you want some help, this is where you got to get it. Open your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 9 
And uh, let's look at one verse. We'll read a bunch of verses before we get through. But I want to I want to read one verse to get us started. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 17, we'll read this one verse just to kind of give us the tone of the chapter. <coughs> this chapter is about <coughs> Daniel's 70 weeks, the famous prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And, uh, but before this prophecy is given at the last of the chapter, at the end of the chapter, there's a whole huge section of this chapter that's wrapped up in prayer. And so I want us to look at verse number 17 to get us started. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon the, thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Father, please bless us as we look into your precious word for light and understanding. And Lord, I pray that that light would shine in our hearts that we would truly be enlightened. And Lord, that we would know more about prayer and how to go about it, learning from a great man like Daniel. I pray that you'd bless us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, you've got, you got your fill-in-the-blanks. Anybody need one of those, a fill-in-the-blank sheet? Anybody need one? Everybody's got one, right? Okay. Uh, if, I, if I skip over a blank or something, sometimes I get running fast and just run past one of them. And if I do... Somebody just hold up your hand and slow me down a little bit and we'll back up and get it. It's okay. It's Wednesday night. We're a little, we're just kind of a little bit, uh, <clears throat> what, un, uh, unorthodox maybe on Wednesday night. I mean, we just start whenever we want to. We're supposed to start at 7. We may start 7.15 or 7.30. No, not, <laughs> not always, but kind of that way tonight. We're in Daniel chapter number 9. Now, this could be called, this chapter 9 could be called the high point of the prophecy in the book of Daniel. Daniel. This could be the crowning jewel of all the prophecies. But this revelation was given to Daniel after some very special preparations had taken place for intercessory prayer by this man Daniel. And he prayed for his home country, Israel, and for his people, his brethren. And it might be that as we read and study about the way Daniel prepared to pray and the way he did pray, it might be that you and I could be edified from it and that we might learn how to pray a little bit better than we do now. I want you to notice there's three things on your outline. Number one is Daniel's preparation. Verses 9, or chapter 9, 1 through 15, it all tells about his preparation for this prayer in, uh, in actual preparation to receive the vision uh, from the heavenly messenger towards the end of the chapter. But here in these verses, uh, in verse 1 through 15, we're going to see several things that will help us to prepare our own selves for prayer. Do you feel sometimes like when you pray that you just don't want to? Do you feel like sometimes when you pray that maybe God is not listening? Do you feel like sometimes when you pray that your prayers may hit a brass ceiling and bounce back? Do you pray sometimes and wonder why you didn't get the answer you wanted? Well, I don't know that we can solve all the mysteries of prayer in this one passage because the Bible is full of prayers and instructions about praying. But I think if we're going to learn from somebody besides the Lord Jesus himself, I think Daniel would be a pretty good fellow to follow after because he was pretty good at walking with God. Notice under his preparation, his perusal of the Word. I'm talking about the Word of God. His perusal. What is perusal anyway? Sometimes I think we use that word wrongly. Sometimes people say, well, I just grabbed up the paper and perused a little bit of it. Well, they, they mean it in a way that means I just kind of glanced at it or I, I was speed reading through it. But perusal really means that you dig into it and you look at it and read it. You slow down and absorb it. And Daniel was actually absorbing the Word of God. Now look, look with me in verse number 1 and I'll show you. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, 
of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by what? Books. The number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish, watch this, 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So all of a sudden, Daniel finds some answers. He sees the, the numbers totaling up that the 70 years that's pertaining to his captivity and his brethren's captivity, he's seeing it in the Scripture. He's reading in the book of Jeremiah. And he has studied the book of Isaiah. And, uh, and by looking at the Word of God, he begins to put two and two together, and he's finding out some stuff that's really going to be exciting to him, and it will be to you and me too. But I want you to just see at the very first the time of Daniel's study, the time of his study. When is this? Well, he says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. This was about 538 B.C. Now, they had been taken captive along about 605 or 606 B.C. So that's important because he's, he's winding down that 70 years captivity. They've been sentenced to 70 years captivity in the land of Babylon. And so it's winding down and uh, he sees that, that the time is short that, that they're going to be sent back. They're going to be allowed to go back to their homeland. And so... Daniel chapter 5, chapter 8, and chapter 9 all evidently take place during the same year. It says in verse number 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Now when it says I understood by books, what you may want to just understand it this way. When he says I understood by books, it's like, it's like uh, if I said, Look, I, I was reading in the scripture today and, and I understood by the book what's going to happen. I understood by the book. I understood in the book. I understood from a study of the book. Are you with me? So he's studying the Word of God. You say, well, what's that got to do with prayer? <laughs> well, it's got a lot to do with prayer. And, and we'll see in just a little bit. But I want you to notice number two on your outline, the object of Daniel's study. What was he studying in the Word of God? Well, he was studying the book of Jeremiah... And so he would have discovered from the time frame in the book of Jeremiah, he would have discovered uh, the time frame of the whole situation. Now, he might have been perplexed as he was reading this because he's uh, in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 28, he would have realized that, uh, that the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem was just about at hand. He's in captivity and his people's in captivity. The temple's been destroyed. Jerusalem's been destroyed. But if he's been reading in Isaiah, he's already figured out, hey, it's about time for the temple to be rebuilt. He's studying, he's studying prophecy that's being fulfilled right before his eyes. And his own visions that we studied about in our last message, his own visions reveal to him that there's four world kingdoms that have to come and go before complete fulfillment of everything. So he's really perplexed probably thinking about this. If he's thinking, well, he totaled up the years. It's supposed to be 70 years of desolations from Jeremiah, 70 years that Jerusalem is left desolate and the temple's been torn down, and we're about to get out of here after that 70 years. And let's see, there's been one kingdom that's come and gone. That was Nebuchadnezzar's. And then there's a second kingdom in place but how could two more kingdoms world kingdoms come and go in the next two years <laughs> well what he didn't realize until he began to study was the fact that that this 70 years of desolation that Israel is spending in Babylon is actually a foreshadowing of seven times that amount of dispersion of the Jews over the whole world before it's all fulfilled and so he's beginning to get some things here that's coming together in his head. He said, where did he get a Bible anyway? They were carried away captive. Well, probably the scroll of Isaiah and the scroll of Jeremiah. You remember they didn't have the Word of God then in bound books. Every once in a while somebody says, uh, you mean you, uh, you use an iPad for your notes and reading the Bible sometimes? Yeah, I do. Uh, I had a lady to challenge me one day, and she said, well, just where do you... She said, I've heard you 
uh, say that you had the Word of God when you were looking at your iPad. She said, how can you say that's a King James Bible looking at your iPad? I said, do you ever read a verse of Scripture on a billboard going down the highway? She said, yeah. I said, was that the Word of God? She said, well, yes. I said, have you ever read some Scriptures that was put on the screen uh, when you're watching TV, maybe watching a TV preacher, and you saw some Scriptures on the screen? I said, was that the Word of God? Well, yes. I said, uh, have you ever seen uh, us put Scriptures on the wall with a PowerPoint presentation and put a verse up there? I said, isn't isn't that the Word of God? And she said, yes. I said, then why wouldn't it be the Word of God if it's shown on my iPad screen? Huh? The Word of God is the Word of God. It doesn't matter if it's printed on paper or if it's shown on an electronic screen or if some preacher quotes it from the pulpit. It's still the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and it doesn't matter how you record it and how you, uh, how you put it out, put it forth. It's still the Word of God, right? That's right, yeah. And so Jeremiah didn't have a beautiful leather-bound Bible like this one Brother Marcus got me. Boy, I love that Bible, by the way. If, you want to, if you're going to buy a new Bible, ask Brother Marcus where, where he got these, and he can tell you where to save some money and get a good Bible. But Jeremiah didn't have one of these. Daniel didn't have one of these. What did they have? Probably a scroll <laughs> where they'd wrote on uh, sheepskins, vellum, and rolled it up like a roll of paper towels, and, uh, and they would unroll that and read it as they unroll it. And so probably Daniel had one of these, or somebody had one, uh, when they were taken captive out of Jerusalem back at the beginning of the 70-year ca captivity, and Daniel got his hands on it. And so when he says the books here, he's talking about the Old Testament canon of books. Uh, Jeremiah, it's verified. He's, he's, uh, he's assured that the book of Jeremiah is the Word of God. Can I just tell you that every book that's in this Bible, every book of the Bible is the Word of God? Uh, they didn't miss anything. God said that He would preserve it from this generation uh, forever in, in Psalms chapter 12. And so as the Word of God has been written, yes, the old time saints, they carried around... They carried around bits and pieces of it like this. It wasn't in a pretty leather-bound Bible, but they might have a little bit of, of Isaiah here, and they might have a little bit of Jeremiah here, and might have a little bit of Genesis here, and, and, uh, and they had bits and pieces, and it wasn't until later on until they began to gather all these together. And uh, so when, when we talk about our King James Bible, our Old Testament is basically, the Old Testament comes from a family of manuscripts called the Masoretic Text. And it's what the Jews held together through all these years. They believed that that was the Word of God. Even the modern versions, even the modern versions still use the Masoretic, Masoretic text generally for their Old Testament. It's in the New Testament where the modern versions really go downhill fast. <laughs> because our King James Bible is based on the, the, King, the King James manuscripts, the Textus Receptus. And, uh, and that's a family of manuscripts that is not perverted like the Alexandrian manuscripts that have gone into the New Testament of the modern versions. We don't, we don't just choose the King James Bible because it just really sounds nice to have the old language. <laughs> I mean, I think the old language is reverent, much more reverent than the street language that's in the modern versions. That is true. But that's not the primary reason we use a King James Bible. We use a King James Bible because the New Testament, especially the New Testament portion of it, now there's problems in the Old Testament in their translation too, but as far as the, the source of their uh, manuscripts, they use the Masoretic text for the uh, Old Testament. The New Testament comes from the uh, Textus Receptus. And it's just a bunch of pieces of manuscripts that's housed in the museums all over the world and the King James translators had their hands on, on those manuscripts and they knew how to, how to select the ones that were right and discard the ones that had been corrupted. And so our, our King James Bible is revered and trusted and uh, it's perfect because it comes from a perfect set of manuscripts. And we don't doubt anything that's in the, in the Bible. We believe it all. And uh, in fact, the King James Bible, I believe the King James Bible, the, the, there's several Greek manuscripts. There's a Stephanus and the Biza and, uh, and, and uh, Elsevier brothers and, uh, and several different ones, Erasmus, a lot of different Greek New Testament uh, 
manuscripts, family of manuscripts. And so somebody might say, well, which one do you follow? I follow the King James one. <laughs> because if you take the King James Bible and look at the Greek that corresponds with it exactly, the King James Bible is, in fact, its own variety of Textus Receptus. Now, everybody's completely satisfied and understands everything I just said, right? <laughs> okay. Well, just believe, you can do this. You can just believe your King James Bible is 100% accurate. <laughs> it has no mistakes in it, and it's always been accurate before it was translated, accurate after it was translated because God preserved it. Now, let's move along. Now, the, the Jewish um, leaders back in... in uh, in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah lived, listen to this, Jeremiah lived and ministered at the time that the Hebrews were carried captive into Babylon. He was a contemporary of Daniel. Daniel was a teenager about that time when Jeremiah was preaching uh, when they were carried away captive. And so now Daniel is old. Jeremiah's passed off the scene, but he knows that Jeremiah was a prophet of God. And he knows that the writings were inspired by God. And even though the Jewish leaders of, of, of that day, of the day of Jeremiah, they tried to destroy Jeremiah's writings, and they took a pen knife. You can, you can, I don't know if I put it on your outline. Write this down, Jeremiah 36, 1 through, Jeremiah 36, 1 through 26. The leaders tried to cut out parts of the Bible and just destroy it. And they tore up tore up Jeremiah's writings. But after they got through trying to destroy it, God just gave it to him again. <laughs> you can read about it in that chapter. It's good. And so God just gave it to him again, so it just survived. That's what I'm talking about, preservation. Some, some people are worried that, that what we've got in our Bible is not pure and uh, because it's passed down through the hands of men. And I just tell you that men are not stronger than God. And if God said he would preserve the word of God, he did. Yeah. We've got it. And so although they tried to destroy it, they couldn't. When we read the word of God, here's the, here's the bottom line. Talking about preparation for prayer. When we read the word of God, it prepares our heart to pray effectively and intelligently. Study the word of God and you'll know how to pray better. Then... That was the, Daniel's perusal of the study of the Word of God. Now, his premeditation of the way. His premeditation of the way, the way to pray. Verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. What are we talking about here? Daniel, before he began to just unleash his prayer, not only did he study the Word of God, so he knew he was praying properly, but he also prepared his heart. He premeditated the way of prayer. He was thinking about some things in his heart. A lot of times we just rush into a prayer. We've got our, look, we've got a, a, a memorized prayer that, that we could just say it in our sleep a lot of times. Are you with me? We say the same words in the same way and, 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 and we might as well just put it on a, on a CD, <laughs> record it and put it in the computer and push the play button and let the CD repeat our prayer because we say it the same way. Same words. God said, uh, uh, Jesus said in Matthew, He said, it's not by vain repetitions. That's not how we get heard by God. And so our, what do we need? We need some heart preparation. We need our hearts prepared so that when we pray, our heart is in tune. It's like playing your guitar, brother. If you get up with a guitar that's out of tune, it doesn't do much of a job of presenting music. <laughs> and, uh, and the same thing is true of our prayer. Our heart needs to be tuned up so that it sounds like music in God's ear. I'm not talking about fancy flowery language. I'm just talking about a heart that's prepared. A heart that is in tune with God. Before Daniel started praying, we see that he, that he pre-thought pre -thought his prayer and what he was going to do. 
Notice the activity of prayer. Verse 3, he says, I set my face. That means he set a special time that he's going to pray. He set this special time. Now, it's true. It's true. Look, you can be driving down the road and pray, and, uh, and you're just driving along and something comes to your heart, and you can pray then. You can be working at an assembly line or, or building something or washing dishes, and you can pray. You can do all of that. You can just stop right where you are in the middle of the house and stop and pray right there. But Daniel here set a season of prayer and he's ready, he's preparing his heart and he's making this a special time where he gets alone with God. I think too many times, because we know we can pray anywhere, anytime, I think sometimes we get a little lax about our praying and we don't do like Daniel did here. And he says, I set my face he got serious about praying he prepared his heart he read the word of God and he got ready to meet with the master <laughs> that's the activity of prayer and then in verse number 3 he said he set his face to do what to seek look at verse 3 again and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes that means heart preparation he's seeking in other words, as opposed to vain, excuse me, vain repetitions, he was preparing his heart to connect with God. He wasn't just spouting some words. Now, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I play them so I keep. And I, <clears throat> you know. That doesn't mean much, does it? But he's preparing his heart. Notice what else he's doing. He talks about <clears throat> the attitude of prayer in verse 3. He says, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. What's that all about? Fasting, uh, going without food, talks about that, that speaks of steadfastness. And it's not just the physical outward part of fasting that prepares us to pray. It's not a ceremony or a ritual that we use as a bargaining chip to get what we want from God. Are you listening? I can starve myself and do without all my cheeseburgers all day long, and that's not going to buy God off. That's not going to buy him off. But if I say to the Lord, Lord, I'm really seeking your face, and I'm going to, I want to just put my, I want to put my flesh behind me so that my spirit is ready to, to come in, con, into contact with you. And I'm not trying to use going without food to show you how great I am, Lord. I know what a sinner I am. So I'm not using my fasting as will worship. I'm just doing it to, Put my flesh in its place so that my spirit can hear you, Lord. That's what fasting does. And so the fasting is steadfastness. The sackcloth is humility. Sackcloth, they would put, it's kind of like we would call it a toe sack in Arkansas, an old burlap feed bag. Uh, when the old-time Jews wanted to show that... Uh, that they were being humbled by their sin. They would put on sackcloth, just old rough, toe sack-like garments. And then the ashes portrays mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning. Our heart, if we're, pray, if we're preparing our heart to really meet with God, we, we need to be able sometimes to mourn in our heart. I'm not saying we always ought to be crying and sad when we pray, but I'm just saying in, in a situation like Daniel's in, he, was, he realized what his people had done. He realized what he had done. And he realized the situation they were in. They're captives. It's time to mourn. And if we don't mourn, sometimes, I don't think we're really getting close to God. Because I believe God mourns over the sinfulness of our nation. And we need to be able to confess the sins of our nation and, and confess our own sins and the sins of our family and the sins of our church and the sins of our city. And we need to be able to mourn. And notice the third thing under there, his penitence of the wrongs. And that's what we're going into right now. Verses 5 through 15. He says, look at your first five. We won't read all of them. He says, we have sinned. Notice the pronoun there. What is it? We. He's not saying, Lord, that Israel, that Israel, that Israel, that's a bunch of jerks. They're a bunch of backslidden heathen. He didn't say they. He said we. He said, we have sinned and we have committed iniquity. 
and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. He's putting himself in it. He's saying we. And if we're going to be right with God and have our heart, listen, if we're going to have our heart prepared to uh, go to the Lord in prayer, we need to be penitent. I'm not talking about offering some kind of Catholic nonsense where we pay for our sins and, and, and uh, you know, carry some cross or something like that. I'm talking about getting our heart before God when we confess our sins. He didn't offer any excuses. He didn't point the fingers at somebody else. He didn't even mention his own faithfulness. He was a faithful man, but he didn't say, Hey, God, remember now how good I've been to you and how good I've servant I've been, Lord. He didn't say any of that. He didn't mention his privileged position before God, that he's a special person in this kingdom that God is using. He didn't mention his privileged position with God. And there was no plea of victimhood. He didn't say, Lord, you know how I've really been, uh, how I've been mistreated in all this. And Lord, anybody, anybody could have sinned if they'd been mistreated like me. Our nation is full of a bunch of sissy, limp-wristed, panty-waisted uh, victims who want to blame everything on everybody else and say, I'm a victim and therefore everybody owes me something. That's why people uh, vote the way they do in presidential elections for somebody that's going to hand them out more free stuff because they're victims. Hey, friend, I'll tell you what. If somebody thinks they're a victim, they ought to go and live in India a little while, right, Brother Paul, Miss D? Go live in, in the Philippines for a little bit. Go over to one of the Muslim countries and live over there for a little bit. You'll know what victims are then. Hey, we've got it pretty good in spite of all the craziness that's going on in our own land. We've got it pretty good here. And we're not victims and we ought not to act like victims. Notice what he talks about. In verses 5 and 6, he talks about the guilty parties and he names everybody from the kings to, to all. The guilty acts, verses 6, verse 10 through 12, the guilty acts, he's named sin. He names sin one by one. He calls sin by its name. Hey, look, when we, when we get ready to pray, when we confess our sins, we don't need to just say, now, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Huh? We need to name them. Forgive me for my laziness, God. Forgive me for my stinginess. Forgive me for my, for my unconcern for the lost. Forgive me for my lack of studying and reading the Bible. Forgive me for, for my lack of compassion on my brethren. We need to name things one by one. One old preacher said, hey, he said, we like to commit our sins retail and then get rid of them wholesale. <laughs> we, need to, we need to confess them like they came. Now, you don't have to do that to get saved, thank God. To get saved, you just admit to God you're a sinner because you can't remember all your sins when you get saved. But as we walk with him daily, we need to get forgiveness of the sins that he calls to our attention, and we need to make sure we do it that way. Then he mentions also the guilty verdict. They're, they're guilty. Go to big number two on your outline, Daniel's petition. The petition means just prayer. Uh, his petition, he's asking God for something. His petition, verses uh, 16 through 19. John R. Rice wrote a, a book one time. It was entitled Prayer, Asking and Receiving. He said that's what prayer is. It's asking and receiving. Some people uh, want to take you on a journey through outer space as uh, they talk about each planet that God created and all of that. God knows the planets He created and He doesn't need us to recite them back to Him. Uh, what God does like is for us to ask Him for things like we would a father. Daniel's petition, verses 16 through 19. Let's, let's look at just a couple of these. Chapter 9, verse 16, he says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem and thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a repro reproach to all that are about us. Do you notice how many times he said there, he said, he said, Lord, I, I wish you'd turn away from your anger because your reputation's at stake, Lord. He said, he talked about thy city, Jerusalem, and thy mountain, and thy people. 
He's saying to God, these are yours, God. And, and Lord, we're asking you to turn away from your anger and your punishment because, Lord, people will, people will think you're not good to us. And so he's, he's relating to God by telling God how great he is and how God's nature is to be loving and merciful. We need to remind God of that. It's not like he doesn't know. But when we come to him in humility and say, God, you remember how merciful you are. That's why we can take 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we can remind God of that. And it's not that he's forgotten, but he wants to see it in us that we recognize his goodness and his mercy and his grace. Notice on your outline, Daniel's petition and then his approach. He invokes God's reputation, uh, talking about thy city, thy mountain, thy people. Then notice his appeal. His appeal, asking God to cease from his anger and restore his people and promises. And then his argument, last part of verse 18. In last, verse 18 he says, <clears throat> For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. <laughs> that's the way God likes for us to talk. And then his, that's his argument. He's saying, God... You're not doing it because we deserve it. We're asking you to forgive us because that's just like you to do that. That's your promises, Lord. Big number three, Daniel's product. Well, what happens? Now, we're leading up to this big revelation, this prophecy that God's going to give Daniel. But Daniel's uh, he's preparing to pray, and then he, then he goes into his prayer. And Now, what happens because of his prayer? Verse 20 through 23. Let's read those three, four verses. Uh, verse number 20, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking. Watch this. You ought to underline that phrase right there. Whilst I was speaking. He's still praying. Watch this. Yet whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, here's an angel shows up, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, Gabriel's an angel, and it does say that he flies swiftly here because Daniel is praying, and while he's still praying, God taps Gabriel on the shoulder, and he says, Now, do you see Daniel down there praying? I want you to run down there and give him a message for me. Hop to it. Off that angel goes. Just like Superman. No, faster than Superman. He's flying at a rate of speed that was, I don't know where heaven's at. Curtis Hudson said it was above the North Star. I don't know if anybody knows where it's at or not. But I know it's a long ways off. And yet, before Daniel finished his prayer, here's Gabriel interrupting his prayer. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Can you say... God had the prayer on the way before Daniel got through praying. <laughs> I've used that illustration a thousand times, but I still love it about when we were in $5,000 in debt and we prayed one afternoon about 3 o'clock for God to help us get the $5,000 we needed to pay off that debt. It was getting desperate. We knelt down in our living room floor and prayed, and I got up off the floor and remembered I hadn't been to the mailbox. Went out to the mailbox and opened it up, and in there was a card with a check for $5,000 in it from some people who didn't have a clue that we needed $5,000. It wasn't for a penny less or a penny more. It was exactly what we prayed for, $5,000. Do you know... <laughs> that God already knew about that prayer before we ever prayed it and had it in the mail and in the mailbox when we went out there to see about our answered prayer, there it was. <laughs> God sent Gabriel out of heaven faster than a speeding bullet and arrived on the scene while Daniel's still in his, in his prayer. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that makes me kind of excited. <laughs> He was interrupted in his prayer as it is. Well, look at, turn to this one verse, Isaiah 65. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24. I want you to see this. This will be precious to you. You can mark it down and use it. 
Isaiah chapter 65. It's almost the end of the book. Isaiah 65 and verse number 24. And this shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Woo! <laughs> God already said, don't you know Daniel must have already read that scripture? And then all of a sudden when Gabriel shows up on the scene to give him an answer to his prayer, old Daniel must have said, wow, that verse is really true. God said he had answered before I get through praying, and here he went and done it, man. He already done it. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> the angelic caller, verse number 21. Who is this guy? Well, his name is Gabriel. What is his appearance? Look at, look at verse number 21 uh, back in our text again. I'm trying to not go, take up my whole 10 minutes extra there. Uh, chapter 9 and verse number 21. It says, uh, no, go to verse number uh, 22. Well, no, wait, stay, in, stay in verse number 21. He says, Being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And uh, so he, he's got the appearance of a man, although he flies. So he probably didn't even have a cape like Superman. Don't suppose he had wings. I, I mean, depends on how you classify angels. If you classify cherubim and seraphim and teraphim and the beasts in Revelation, there's a lot of them in heaven that do have wings. Uh, many of them who were sent to earth, like the ones that came to Abraham, apparently they just looked like an ordinary man, didn't have wings, but they could fly. That's better than having wings, ain't it? <laughs> fly without wings. I've always wanted to fly. I mean, without an airplane. Tried it one time, climbed up on the chicken house when I was about eight years old. Got me a, piece, a couple of pieces of big cardboard flaps and cut slots in them, stuck my arms out through them, got up on top of the chicken house, went out the edge. I thought I'd fly over to Granny and Papa uh, Brooks. I'd fly over across the holler to their house, and so I just leaped off of the chicken house. Straight down. <laughs> Didn't work. That was my last time to try to fly. His name was Gabriel, his appearance, well, the ones that came at, at Jesus' uh, resurrection, they were bright and shining, glowing, white. His duties, well, his duties was to see after people like Daniel. And his abilities, man, he could fly and he was strong. The angelic arrival, verse 21. And Daniel says it was about the time of the evening oblation. Oh, what's this? That's the evening sacrifice that's offered at the temple in Jerusalem. But wait a minute. There's no temple in Jerusalem. There's no Jerusalem anymore. It's all been destroyed. And yet Daniel says it was about the time of the evening oblation. What does that tell us? That tells us that this boy who was a teenager who got carried away uh, as a teenager 70, nearly 70 years ago still has it firmly in his mind, the temple of God and those sacrifices. You know, the things that we learn here and learn in our Bible study and learn in our prayer time and, and our Bible reading, those things can stick in there for a lifetime. Thank God for the young people that come to church and are faithful to church, and they'll have some memories that will stick with them for a lifetime. I tell you what, coming to church, listen to me, coming to church and learning the Word of God is more important than little league ball and basketball and Boy Scouts and all the other things that we could do. The one thing that is indispensable is the Word of God and paying honor to the Lord's house. Old Daniel still remembered the Lord's house, that temple way back yonder and that smoke going up from that offering late in the evening. He still remembered it. What was the angelic message? Verse 22 and 23 says, And he informed me, verse 22, and talked with me. How long has it been since you talked to an angel? <laughs> and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. I could use some of that. Why about you? <laughs> verse 23, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. There's where God told him to go. There's where... Uh, that's when God told old Gabriel to take off down there to see Daniel. He said, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. I know some preachers that call their congregation, Beloved. <laughs> hey, beloved, let me tell you this. Beloved. You know, you're, you are beloved. You're beloved. God loves you. And you have a special place in your heart especially if you live like Daniel did. You live close to him. You walk with God. 
you pray and read your Bible. God loves that, and he calls you beloved. And he says, I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So the message, the message that the angel delivers to Daniel is a great message, probably the highlight of all the prophecies in this book, and that's the subject of next week's message. And we'll go into the message itself. But this is the preparation for prayer. Are you as satisfied with your prayer life as you want to be? If not, hang on to your notes. Read this passage of Scripture again and let God speak to you about how you pray and see if He'll help you to draw closer to Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Our Father, we are thankful that you've given us the same privilege to pray and to talk to you as Daniel had. Our Lord, we understand that you're not going to give us new scripture to be written in the book. It's finished. We know that. We know you're probably not going to send an angel to talk to us face to face. We understand that because you've already given us a book that's finished to tell us everything you want us to know. But Lord, we like to walk with you and we like to talk with you. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be challenged to have these special times like Daniel had where we're just not in a hurry and we can go somewhere and sit down and comp contemplate and premeditate how we're going to approach you, Lord. And I pray that you'd make this a matter of deep concern and love in our own hearts that we'd just love to walk with you and and meet with you in special occasions. Lord, I pray that you'd give us many of those special occasions where we can sense your nearness and your voice that we can hear in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Piano's playing. If you need to come, the altar is open.